Hello, and welcome to Finnegan's webcast, 35 USC 101, Where Are We Now? Questions of Law and Fact. Thanks for joining us. I'm Linda Thayer, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome my co-presenters, Rachel Emsley, Manakshi Chakravorty, and Diane Lettler. We've assembled a well-qualified panel of pre presenters with diverse backgrounds and lots of hands-on experience with this issue. Manakshi is Senior IP Counsel at Philips Lighting, which just five days ago changed its name to Signify. Manakshi focuses more on patent prosecution and portfolio development and strategies for getting patents in this ever-changing environment. Diane is Senior Managing Counsel at JCPenney and is currently responsible for all patent litigation facing the company. So you know she has a lot to say about 101 in the litigation context. Rachel's an attorney at Finnegan's Boston office specializing in post-grant proceedings and district court proceedings where Section 101 frequently plays a role in strategy. Rachel's been deep in 101 issues for many years, including as a member of Finnegan's team that in, 19, in uh, 2009 argued the famous Bilsky, Bilsky v. Kapos case uh, to the Supreme Court that started us all thinking about Section 101 perhaps more than we ever had before. So it's been a long road. Today's panel will discuss the most recent decisions and where we are today. But before I turn things over to the presenters, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. Hopefully we'll have a little time at the end to, to get to at least some of them. This is a, meant to be an interactive webinar. So just click on the red Q&A button at the lower center of the webcast interface, and you can type your question in that window there. Then click Submit. The questions uh, will be answered today during the Q&A session to the extent time allows, and uh, that will be at the end of the presentation. You can enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the green Enlarge Window button at the top right of the slide window, and the slides will advance automatically throughout the event, so you can just sit back and enjoy. Uh, if you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow webcast help guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. And now, I'll, without further ado, I'll turn it over to our presenters to begin our presentation. 35 USC 101, where are we now? Welcome, Manakshi, Rachel, and Diane. The floor is yours. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for the introduction. So we will begin with the statute where things are supposed to begin. We have patent eligible subject matter right in the US code. We're all very familiar with this. Whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter, you're supposed to be entitled to uh, meet the requirements of the rest of the title and get yourself a patent. And what we've seen, of course, in recent years is that this has become an increasing ground for folks to uh, argue and win or lose on whether they should uh, be getting a patent at the patent office and whether or not they should have got the patent that they did get at the patent office later on in contentious matters. I want to bring you up to speed really quickly. I think uh, many of us are very familiar with, with how this all came about. Uh, back in the 70s, we had uh, the beginning of the Supreme Court's interest in this area with Benson, and we had tests such as uh, the algorithm test, we've gone through application of the algorithm, the machine or transformation test, up to State Street Bank and the useful concrete tangible result test, and now uh, re most recently with first Mayo um, in 2012-2013, the Mayo Myriad case at the Supreme Court establishing the two-step test for patent eligibility, the something more test. And then with uh, the Alice decision, confirming that that test also applies not only to the natural phenomena, but to abstract idea cases and the technical arts software patents, where many of us practice. So that's the very quick view of the history up till now. Uh, we can't spend a lot of time dwelling on it because so much has happened in the last few years. Um, I think people in the beginning were uh, perhaps surprised by the Alice decision and, and wondered what its effect would be. And this chart here um, from Bilski blog tracking um, the impact of what we thought was a minor case on patent prosecution shows how 
um, and it, it, the colors show you where the red being heating up on 101 um, shows you really that this has had a re pretty big impact on certain art units. Um, and I think that um, that's why we're all still talking about this. So up until 2018, from Alice in, until 2018, we have a good volume of case law telling us what is too abstract and what is eligible. Although we don't have a true test that you can apply to any case that tells you what falls out on the other side of being too abstract or is patent eligible, we have many cases that we're told uh, from both the patent office and from the court that we should be comparing our claims to. So the things that we've learned are too abstract are mathematical formulas and relationships, fundamental economic concepts, a la Bilski and Alice, long practice business methods, automated human activities, processes that can be performed mentally, results-focused methods, and generic and functional components. And I think the cases in 2018, as you'll see um, in our next several slides, have um, reiterated some of these. The results-focused methods and generic functional components come to mind. On the eligible side, we are fortunate to have some cases that are helping those uh, trying to get software patents for advanced, enhanced computer components, improvements to computer functionality, unconventional arrangements of components, specific steps for achieving real-world results, specific technical solutions, and improved graphical user interface functionality. And we've seen a couple of these GUI cases come up uh, thus far in 2018. So that brings us to today. I know that was very, very fast, <laughs> but we have a lot of ground to cover, actually, in the first half of 2018. There seems to have been a lot of cases. Um, but actually, in looking at it this morning, I realized that there have been 12 written decisions on Section 101 this year, and we're almost at the halfway point. And that seems par for the course for 2016 and 2017. We've had, we had 22 written decisions in 2016 and 23 in 2017. So we're on track to meet that same um, volume this year in 2018, although it does seem overwhelming as it has for the last couple of years. Today we're going to focus on what we think are some of the more interesting cases and perhaps some, some that we feel will be um, most impactful on both litigation and prosecution practice. Um, and those cases that we'll cover in more detail are Berkheimer, Atrix Software, Exergen, Voter Verified, and SAP. Hopefully we'll have time to discuss those in, in detail. But I want to um, just highlight a few things about the other cases that we don't have time to discuss and what might be interesting to look back on in those cases. So starting at the top, um, in very early January, we had the FinGen decision. And FinGen dealt with a behavior-based virus scan, and they distinguished this from traditional code matching virus scans. And in that case, claim construction was very key to figuring out whether the claim passed muster under 101. And what you'll see through these cases in 2018 is that we're now dealing with a situation where it may matter exactly where you are in your litigation and how you're going to um, survive 101 or not or be able to uh, push to delay the decision if that's your strategy. In the core wireless decision, uh, we were dealing with improved user interfaces. So this is one of the GUI cases that I referred to earlier. And this improved user interface uh, for computing devices had a particular manner of summarizing and presenting information in electronic devices. The, that, those claims were found eligible, and in that case, the specifications description of the issues with the prior art was something that the court found very helpful. In Move Inc., that case was a method for collecting and organizing information about available real estate properties, and was also a GUI case displaying this information on a digital map that could be manipulated by the user. But in that case, uh, the court came to the contrary decision that those, those claims were not patent eligible. 
And one of the reasons for that was that they felt those claims were aspirational, not technical, lacked Im implementation details, and they were supported, uh, the arguments were supported by a conclusory expert declaration about what was not routine and conventional. And another theme that you'll see as we walk through these cases is that evidence seems to be playing a, a big role now in uh, how 101 is going to come out in the end. Automated tracking, um, this case was pretty interesting because it dealt with systems for locating and identifying um, and tracking objects using RFID components, and that sounds extremely physical. Indeed, there were antennas and things like that in the claims, but ultimately these were found to be ineligible despite that physicality because they lacked a particular configuration or specialized arrangement. And selection, in that, in that case, the selection of the representative claims was key. Another thing that you'll notice um, through this discussion today is that you, um, the care that we have to take in our litigation strategy um, with respect to waivers. In, uh, what, let's see, there's two left here that, that we won't go into huge detail on. Um, the Maxon case, these are very recent, and Inre Ibarra. Um, in, the in the Maxon case, they had conceded um, the abstract idea and they fought out on step two, but there was no, again, no inventive arrangement, only results, and the claims lacked, according to the court, how the results were achieved. And in Inre Ibarra, um, the, these claims were found ineligible. They had to do with advertising, and I think we can all agree, and you'll see with the uh, SAP case later on, that advertising and the financial services sector um, are pretty hit hard and difficult to navigate um, when you're dealing with 101 challenges. If you're having trouble keeping all of these cases straight, and I know that, that it is quite difficult when we're getting um, basically two a month on average from the Federal Circuit. The USPTO has been putting out a very handy guide. This is on their website, the link is there. I apologize that the slide is a little bit fuzzy, so it's difficult to see what's going on there. But they seem to be updating this um, monthly or every other month, and it divides the cases very nicely into categories. Um, the categories they have there are fundamental economic practices, methods of organizing human activity, an idea of itself, and mathematical relationships or formulas. And they list each of the abstract ideas uh, that were at issue in those cases and um, with the case name in parentheses. So it's a very quick, um, quick way to get your head around everything that it has happened in 101 case law in the last several years. So I'm going to pause for a minute and ask of, our, of uh, Manakshi and Diane, up until now, up until 2018, before all of this occurred, how has 101 been affecting your uh, litigation or prosecution strategy? Maybe we can, um, we can talk to Manakshi first about that. Yeah, so uh, since Alice, basically, up until now, uh, even without the 2018 cases, uh, what we've seen is that adding more technical or hardware elements really is not effective anymore. So even if you have sensors and you have all kinds of antennas, uh, the rules have changed. We're not under mach machine or transformation anymore. And under all the new post Alice cases, um, you you really need to focus on something else, which is um, you know for me for me particularly, I have to beef up uh, the written description often uh, with what the inventive con concept really is over the prior art. So how the system is more efficient uh, in terms of data storage or quick, uh, quicker to locate relevant information, faster computationally. Um, this sets up for a better outcome uh, in a 101 challenge, definitely in prosecution and, you know, obviously, in, hopefully in litigation as well. Uh, the Federal Circuit has, you know, repeatedly told us in all these cases, post Alice, that um, inventions which are directed to improvements in the functioning and operating of the computer system in itself, whether it be in software or hardware, uh, those are the ones that will pass master and often pass master under uh, Section 101, uh, Alice Step 1. So um, another important thing I'm seeing is that uh, when working with previously drafted omnibus applications that try to capture multiple inventions in a big application, uh, hoping to 
claim as you go on in uh, new PCT applications, uh, sorry, in new uh, CIP applications as you move along, those are really getting harder to get because in, especially if those claims are very generic or the description is very generic in hopes, hopes of catching newer inventions that they haven't been made yet in CIP applications. Those are getting to be hugely problematic from a one-on-one -on -one standpoint these days. Um, import, uh, the importance of the interview has become, become even greater. Often, you know, if you make nuanced arguments using case law in responses, for example, you want to distinguish your claims from cases that hurt you and align yourself with um, more favorable cases. This is, um, you know, nice to do in the written format, obviously, but, you know, repeated phone calls to the examiner can really help uh, crystallize in the examiner's mind why, why you're more like EnFish and not like something else that, some other case that is potentially problematic for you. So, um, Diane, if you want to add something here. Yes, uh, on the litigation side, I think that, um, in the pre-2018 period, you know, we had some very major cases that guided a lot of litigation strategy. But I think what those cases taught us, if you look like Alice, Bascom, Enfish, all of those cases taught us that it's a highly nuanced strategy and that putting all of your eggs in the 101 basket is fraught with peril because it so much of it depends on the district court jurisdiction that you're in, and then ultimately what Federal Circuit panel you, you end up in front of if you go up on appeal. So um, I think from a litigation strategy standpoint, and it has been since Alice was decided and continues into 2018, is that you have to, as a litigator, plan on you know a, a very adverse panel and how are you going to structure your arguments to appeal to the most um, adverse of the panel members that you might end up with in the Federal Circuit. And you have to be careful as you move forward in terms of setting up your case to meet a shifting burden of proof landscape. That, that is probably one of the hardest things because in the district court you may argue that you've satisfied a certain burden of proof that is operative at the time in which you tried the case. Um, but then by the time you get to the Federal Circuit, you can see that there's really shifting sands now as to the burden of proof, which we'll get into more as we talk about some of the specific decisions. Um, so, Rachel, that, I think that the rest of the litigation strategy is better addressed as we move forward into the 2018 cases. Sure, um, and I'm going to advance the slides. Manakshi is going to take us through um, the 2018, uh, I think, seminal decision that we're seeing, um, Berkheimer. Right, uh, so uh, just to start off with the procedural posture here, uh, Berkheimer appealed the district court summary judgment holding uh, claims one through seven and nine uh, invalid or uh, as ineligible under 101. Uh, the technolo technology at issue was uh, parsing files into multiple objects and tagging the objects to create relationships between them. And these objects were then analyzed and compared to archived objects to determine whether there were variations that existed based on some predetermined rules. So the system basically eliminates redundant storage of common text and graphical elements, uh, which greatly improved uh, operating efficiency and lowered storage requirements. So importantly, in this case, uh, the relationship between the objects within the archive allowed a user to carry out what they call a one-to-many editing process of object-oriented data so that a change to one object could be propagated to all archived documents containing the same object. So this, is, this becomes important later on in the ALICE analysis, so I wanted to present this up front. So um, just a little bit of a um, discussion of the applicable law. This is in the summary judgment context, and of, of course, summary judgment is appropriate when there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact, and the movement is, in, movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. And then patent eligibility under 101 is ultimately an issue of law that may contain underlying issues of fact. So it's best to remember that not every 101 determination contains genuine disputes over underlying facts material to the 101 inquiry. So with that in mind, uh, we'll go into the ALICE uh, step one analysis. So here we need to determine uh, whether the claims at issue are directed to a patent ineligible concept. 
So the district court here held here that claim one was directed to the abstract idea of using a generic computer to collect, organize, compare, and present data for reconciliation prior to the archiving. And uh, the federal circuit agreed with the district court that these claims are similar to claims held to be directed to an abstract idea in some prior cases, notably um, content extraction. If you remember in that case, that had to do with extracting data from hard copy documents using a scanner and then recognizing specific information from the extracted data and then storing that in data in um, memory. So um, moving to step two of the ALICE uh, inquiry, this was to consider the elements of each claim, both individually and as a combination, to determine if there was something more there to transform the nature of the claims into uh, uh, to be patent el eligible under 101. So, best to note that the second state of uh, step of Alice uh, is satisfied when the claim limitations involve more than performance of something that is well understood, routine, and conventional uh, in the pre uh, and previously known to the industry. So uh, the district court here concluded that the claims do not contain an inventive concept under Alice Step 2, Alice Step 2 because they describe steps that employ only well-known, well-understood routine and conventional activity, and the claims were described at a relatively high level of generality. Uh, the federal circuit agreed that claim one does not recite an inventive concept sufficient to transform the abstract idea to be pat patent eligible, However, Berkheimer argued and the federal circuit agreed that the specification described an invention, inventive concept through which uh, you have computer functionality that is improved, for example, by the elimination of redundancy in the archives and this one-to-many editing feature we just talked about. So interestingly, these features, however, did not show up in claim one. So um, only claims four through seven contains the limitations directed to these unconventional inventive concepts that were described in the specification. So the um, specification stated that the one-to-many editing substantially reduced effort needed to update files because a single edit could update every document in the archive linked to that ob object structure. So based on that, the court concluded that there is at least a genuine issue of material fact in light of the spec uh, regarding whether claims four through, nine, uh, four through seven archive documents in an inventive manner. And then the court uh, went on to vacate the district court's grant of summary judgment on 101 with respect to these claims four through seven uh, dependent claims, but affirmed the district court's grant of summary judgment with respect to the other claims, one through three and nine. So um, with this, I'll pass it back to you, Rachel. Sure. Um, before we, we talk a little bit about Berkheimer's effect on prosecution and litigation strategy, I just we wanted to um, talk about Atrix uh, software, which came out shortly after Berkheimer and applied this idea that, um, that there's a mixed question of law and fact here, or reiterated that um, holding. And the, the Federal Circuit vacated the District Court's 12B6 ruling in Atrix software. What's most interesting about this case is um, that there was a dissent, uh, Judge Reyna concurring in part and dissenting in part, um, and specifically Judge Reyna respectfully disagreeing with the majority's statements about the role of factual evidence in a 101 inquiry. And Judge Reyna was afraid that, um, you know, just judging at least by this, um, the statements in this dissent, that the 101 inquiry, um, the concern is that it would be difficult to make this a threshold determination that courts could be used to, um, could use this uh, at the 12B6 stage for an early disposition of the case, because this would allow the patent owner to introduce extrinsic evidence such as prior art publications, other patents, expert opinion, uh, statements that would be taken to be true in their favor um, at that stage in their complaint um, that would um, destroy uh, the opportunity to get at a patent that perhaps should be gotten at via the 101 inquiry. Um, so with that said, um, Diane, what 
what do you foresee, uh, what has been the impact of Berkheimer on litigation strategy, and what do you um, foresee the impact being going forward? Well, the, the key ask, takeaway from our litigation standpoint with Berkheimer is that, number one, the court only found it was potentially, potentially eligible, not ultimately eligible. So um, that, I think, is, is a really key point in terms of what the actual holding of the case was and why it has made it most interesting of the, the PTO's response and handling of the Berkheimer decision. But there are some things that are dropped into Berkheimer that are have to be considered in your litigation strategy going forward, and specifically the finding that, in a footnote that the you have to meet it by clear and convincing evidence that it's invalid under 101. No other panel has picked that up or endorsed that standard of proof, um, but it is something actually that as a litigator you have to be concerned about, and certainly and as you're advising your clients in terms of the risk rewards of a potential 101 motion, um, they have, you have to, I think, advise the client of the shifting burden of proof and, and how burdens of proof and standards of review really impact the ultimate likelihood of success on the merits. Um, and we've seen that if you kind of lay out the different decisions even leading up to 2018, like what was the posture of the case um, and how the standard of review played into it. Although there is still a kind of an underlying feeling that Federal Circuit panels are very still very result-oriented and they they will work the opinion to meet the result that they they want. And that's, I think, the struggle that all of us are having in practicing in this area right now is that you know each you know at the very ends uh, the means justify the ends and you can flip almost any language in any opinion and come out to an opposite result so that obviously plays into your your budgeting how you budget because obviously a, a 101 motion is not a cheap motion now and you have to i think take that into account when you're advising your client um, in terms of you know you don't want to oversell the, the easy out on a 101 because it's certainly not that anymore. Thank you. Um, Manakshi, um, Diane mentioned that the PTO has also uh, taken a look at Berkheimer. Can you tell us a little more about that? Right. Um, I'll just give my take on the post Berkheimer guidance memo from the US PTO. So, um, so this basically addresses the limited question of whether an additional element or combination of elements represents well understood, well understood routine conventional activity. So not much else beyond that. Uh, the examiner, so there's some general uh, guidance given about examiners concluding, so examiners should conclude that an element uh, represents well understood routine conventional actively activity only when uh, the examiner can readily conclude that the element is widely prevalent or in common use in the relevant industry. So that's interesting language. Uh, such a conclusion then should be based on a factual determination that's supported in particular ways described in the memo here that I'll go into in a minute. So um, notably, this analysis is the same analysis on, uh, as used under section 112A as to whether an element is so well known that it need not be described in detail in the patent specification. Um, and again, this question um, of uh, routine, conventional, et cetera, is distinct from patentability over prior art under sections 102 and 103. So a showing that uh, you have additional elements that are obvious or lack novelty is not by itself sufficient to establish that they're well-known routine or conventional. And then, uh, you know, to discuss, the, uh, the memo also goes into discussing an impact on uh, the examination procedure, which is the more imp another interesting part of the memo where um, they're talking about in the step 2B analysis of ALICE, um, an, an additional element is not well understood or routine or conventional unless the examiner finds and expressly supports a rejection in writing uh, with a few of one or more of the following. So either a citation to an express statement in the specification or to a statement made by an applicant during prosecution that demonstrates the well understood routine conventional nature of the additional elements. Um, for example, specification describing additional elements as well understood routine or conventional or using some equivalent term or as commercially available product. Um, 
Interestingly, they say that a finding that, that an element is well understood, routine, or conventional cannot be based uh, simply on the fact that the specification is silent with respect to such an element. Um, again, the, they also say that the examiner can cite to uh, one or more court decisions described in MPEP section 2105.05. There's a bunch of different court, court decisions there that examiners can look to to make analogies, I guess. Um, a citation to a publication that demonstrates uh, well understood routine nature of the additional elements. And here again, they caution that the nature of the publication uh, should be such that uh, the additional elements are described as being widely prevalent or in common use in the relevant field. So um, you can't just have any other, any old publication which uh, is okay in the 102, 103 context maybe. Um, then uh, they're talking about taking official notice of the well-understood routine con uh, conventional nature of the additional elements. So the examiner in, the, in this case has to be certain based on his or her personal knowledge. And the examiner again should be certain that the additional elements are comparable to the types of activity that would suffice under section 112A. Um, and then uh, there's some discussion of how the examiner should evaluate the applicant's response here. So if an applicant challenges the examiner's position um, re with regard to whether an element is well understood routine or conventional, the examiner then needs to reevaluate whether it is readily apparent that these additional elements are indeed well-known routine, et cetera, um, to uh, people who work in that relevant field. So, um, so if the examiner has taken official notice, for instance, the applicant, and the applicant challenges the examiner's position, the examiner is then required to produce um, an item as discussed before, like the citation, citation to the specification, court decisions in the MPEP, a citation to a publication, or produce an affidavit or a declaration um, to set forth specific factual findings that support his or her conclusion. Back to you, Rachel. Sure, I was just wondering as you were speaking, Manakshi, how does this compare with what the PTO was doing before on 101? Is it, do you view this as a big departure in, in how prosecution was being done? Right. I mean, I think this is a big departure in the sense that um, earlier, uh, for official notice particularly, you know, you were at a loss. If the examiner took official notice, you could try to go back and argue that point, but often that was a dead end. And, um, you know, how much ever you tried to explain that, you know, this isn't, um, you know, this isn't so well known, um, that, that wouldn't work. And the sort of the clear separation for the 112 uh, standard as opposed to the 102, 103 standard, that's also kind of and spelled out in this way. Um, I mean, in the MPEP, in, which is going to be in the MPP, I guess, in this um, memo is really great for us. So um, I, I, I am definitely looking forward you know, to working more under these new guidelines. Okay, um, Diane, I think actually the next slide is yours. Or if you want to comment on the Berkheimer guidance, that's great too. Well, I would say under the Berkheimer guidance, um, it, from a litigation perspective, it does form uh, somewhat of a roadmap that you can even use in the litigation context. You know, for the most part, litigation right now is still is still dealing with patents that were prosecuted prior to Alice, and certainly prior to these more recent decisions. So the steps to avoid that the pitfalls um, for litigation down the road haven't necessarily been taken by the prosecution team. So there's still opportunity to, um, to take advantage of the, the delta in time. Obviously, as the calendar advances, you're going to be more likely to see a patent that has issued after being uh, kind of taking these issues into account during prosecution. So you will have less statements to use in the, from the specification. Uh, particularly with respect to things being, uh, you know, widely known and prevalent. I will think, I do think that from, it's very interesting in the memo that the same things are said like multiple ways. So it's kind of like, it, it, it's not just prevalent, it's widely prevalent, which is, you know, kind of redundant. Um, but it, it seems to be a blatant uh, discouragement from an examiner from issuing a 101 uh, rejection. So it'll be very interesting to see how the core responds. And it's not really transparent yet how this impacts 
um, the financial incentives to examiners and what credits they get for doing a 101 rejection or you know so that all of I'm all a firm believer in following the money so it'll be really interesting to see um, how that translates for examiners in you know the real world um, but that's it moving on to the the next case which is the exergen case which I think is ironically it's a non-presidential decision but I think that the discussion that plays out in the opinion is very telling in terms of where the panels are dividing and where judges are dividing on issues. Exergen dealt with uh, a device for, for calculating body temperature based on moving a device over, your, over the, the, their forehead to detect the temperature of blood flowing through the artery in, the, in your forehead and then doing a mathematical calculation. It was challenged under 101. The really interesting procedural background for this case is that there were three different cases. Two of the prior cases that were they were going in parallel and overlapped in time, two of the prior cases at the district court level found various claims of the two asserted patents invalid under 101. One of those cases was found, um, the claims were found invalid on motion for summary judgment. It was appealed to the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit actually affirmed on a Rule 36 the finding of invalidity of those claims. That panel was Dyke, Newman, and Reyna. And as we look at the opinion in Exergen, one of the issues raised on appeal was whether or not that eligibility or ineligibility determination in the thermogenics opinion was uh, had a preclusive effect. And the court held that it did not have a preclusive effect because there were different claims. So, and I think this really highlights the, the nuanced nature of the 101 analysis. It is claim specific, so you have to really be careful as you are proceeding down a path of a 101 challenge that you don't fall into the trap of overgeneralizing what is in the invention. It really does come down to the claim language in each individual claim. So it did not, you know, it's just a very interesting the, that, you know, the plaintiff lost a lot in the thermogenics opinion because it was held invalid, but they still had other claims, different claims asserted in the exergen versus CATS case that they did proceed on and they did prevail at the district court that it was not ineligible under 101. And as the court outlined in that opinion then, and in the majority opinion, it really was very much about burden of proof and standard of review. Um, there's more than one time that the court is making the point that you know they have to give great deference to the district court's fact finding that there were additional elements under step two of the Alice analysis. Um, and that it would take a lot to overcome that. Even though there, it was a de novo review, they still gave great deference. So you have to be really careful as you are arguing a case that you really pay attention to your standards of review and argue to that point. Um, even though if you look at the dist underlying district court opinion, it, it wasn't particularly robust in terms of I didn't find that it was particularly robust in terms of how it got to its finding. But the other thing that's a little bit unique about Exergen is it did go all the way to a jury verdict, and you're, so you're talking about post-trial motions, which again, it's about burden of proof, standards of review. And I think that the, the judge, the court, the Federal Circuit really did seem to play into the fact that the judge had heard all the evidence at trial. So there had been a full evidentiary development of the record as opposed to simply a motion for summary judgment, which is by definition a more abbreviated presentation of the evidence. Um, so all of those factors I think played into how the majority ruled. Um, and of course they also still hone in on what parties have already stated there's no dispute now. So in the step one part of the analysis, there was no dispute that the asserted claims employed a natural law to achieve the purpose. So it, it, the case was entirely a step two analysis. And when you get to the step two analysis, the Federal Circuit really distinguished 
the Mayo and Ariosa synchronon decisions based on what the parties in the prior decisions had agreed were not in dispute. So as the patent owner, they made a very smart move in terms of disputing a lot of points that and not giving up on those too early in the case. Of course, that means that you, they had to come forward with what that proof was in terms of what was actually the inventive step. The other thing that's really interesting in terms of how the appeal was presented is that Katz presented Claim 14 as a representative claim. The patent owner argued all the claims. They did not fall into the representative claim analysis approach. So I think that is very telling as well in terms of how you approach the arguments in the case depending on whether you are challenging or whether you are the patent owner. And I think there is an argument to be made that there was a mistake made by Katz in not taking on individual claims more specifically in the appeal process. Um, they really limited themselves by focusing on Claim 14. Judge Hughes dissented in the Exergen case um, and his dissent, I think, is important because it really highlights the philosophical differences that are, are emerging between the justices. And unfortunately, as an appellant, um, you really have to look at what your panel is and how that's likely to play out. And again, I kind of come back to how you advise a client now, I think is informed by this philosophical, political struggle that's occurring amongst the judges and and how it's become so panel specific um, and technology specific. So those are all things I think that as counselors we have to be attuned to as we um, advise the client. Um, the other case to talk about today is, and I think it's probably a lesser important case, um, was the voter verified case. Um, that one was found, um, that was a claim just about a, a voting system, and I won't, the claims are really involved, and I'm not going to go through all the language, but um, the, the court found that the, the invention claimed was ineligible, and interestingly, this was an affirmance of a dismissal under Rule 12b-6, which is, you know, typically considered to be harder and harder to come by. Um, and the, but the court did find that um, the claims as a whole were not were not drawn to anything other than an abstract idea. But again, in the step two part of the analysis, there was no dispute that the claims recite a general purpose computer, and that simply stating in the claim the standard computer components are not sufficient to transform abstract claims into eligible subject matter is a recurring theme through these cases. I think. You know, voter verified, I think, was designated as precedential because there was a um, issue preclusion attack made because this, again, was similarly, there were parallel prior cases in which uh, different decisions were reached. Um, and they tried to say that they had not waived um, claims uh, or arguments because Alice came in after the time the arguments were made, but the court held that Alice was not a change in the law for purposes of issues preclusion, and so then they went on to a deeper analysis of issue preclusion that really is it's quite case specific, but I think that the whole issue preclusion basis was why the case was designated as precedential, much more so than the uh, 101 analysis, because it really falls pretty much in line with what we've seen on other software cases that only include general references to standard computer components. So with that, I will uh, pass that back then to Rachel. Thank you, Diane. I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for questions. I'll go very quickly through the last case that we wanted to highlight today for you, a very uh, recent case, SAP America versus InvestPix. Um, this case came out on May 15th, so just um, a few days ago. And it's interesting to me, number one, because it's a system claim, again, with um, some very physical components, um, a database and processors doing particular uh, com computations, um, and this statistical analysis that uh, the patentee said was, was inventive. Um, 
In this case, uh, the, the court affirmed the district court's Rule 12C judgment on the pleading, so we're at a later stage than a, a 12B6. Um, but we, they said, I thought this was very interesting, we may assume that the techniques claimed are groundbreaking, innovative, or even brilliant, but that's not enough for eligibility. So for me, that, that evoked sort of the same frustration I felt when reading Sequinom. Um, if you recall, Sequinom dealt with a, a new kind of diagnostic that was also very groundbreaking in detecting fetal DNA in maternal blood, but um, that those claims also uh, fell down under 101, even though they were very groundbreaking. And here, the SAP claims in, in another very difficult field, um, the financial services sector, um, is uh, you know falling, even though um, the court is almost admitting uh, that that these things are very uh, innovative. It begs the question, and we can philosophize on this <laughs> later, whether 101 is really weeding out the inventive from the non-inventive. But here, um, they they performed the two-step analysis and came to the conclusion that there was um, there was nothing patent eligible, and they distinguished both McRow and the sales case, um, even though here um, there was an application of an algorithm this, um, and a report generated um, under old tests. Arguably, this might have passed muster where it applies an algorithm and produces a useful report in the end. Uh, but under our current framework, does not pass, according to the Federal Circuit. Uh, I wanted to also highlight for you, um, before we get to some questions, you heard Diane allude to this a few times, um, that we're looking at some panel-specific issues, and I've been personally tracking this since Mayo in a spreadsheet. and. I'm able to run this data and show us exactly where the justices or the judges fall out um, and where the divides are. So, uh, you know, you can, you can look at this. Um, but essentially what you have towards the left, I suppose, are the more, um, more likely to hold that something is patent eligible with Newman at the far left, uh, Rader, of course, no longer on the court, and at the far right, Judges Schall and Clevenger, who have never uh, made, participated um, on a panel and found claims to be patent eligible. Um, and this chart is particularly post-Mayo cases with written decisions, whether they are precedential or non-precedential. So um, it is possibly useful to those who are trying to do as Diane suggested and set up their case to talk to the most adverse judges, you can look over to the right. Unfortunately, of course, in the Federal Circuit Appeal, you don't have the luxury of knowing who your judges are um, before you, you're writing your briefs. Um, so that's, a, of course, the challenge. And I think that we skipped over a few questions that we wanted to answer during the, um, during the webinar, and perhaps I will pass it back to Diane, do do any of the results on this chart um, of the judges surprise you, or is this what you expected to fall out? Um, is this what you were talking about before? Yeah, I mean, no, it it is pr pretty well aligned with what you would expect. I will say that you ha the the analysis of where the judges are seems to also fall into a more granular pattern when you start breaking it out by technology. And I think when you start breaking it out by technology is where you see greater struggle politically and philosophically amongst the judges. And that's a way, that is a war that we are seeing waged on, on the broader landscape in patent law, and it is reflected in the composition of the court as well. And, and that's not a good place to be as a litigant. And I think that, again, they come back to like counseling the client and managing the client's expectations about what could happen to a 101 challenge. You know, it comes down to if you've succeeded at the district court level, you obviously are in a better position going up to the federal circuit because of how the standard of review and deference is playing in with respect to um, the fact findings being made at the district court. But it also requires that you pay greater attention to 
getting, making sure that there's enough in the district court opinion to support that fact finding to survive the deference challenge uh, on appeal, potentially. It also is something that informs the client's decision with respect to how much to spend on a federal circuit appeal. If you have not succeeded at the district court, they have to understand the, the precariousness of that argument before the federal circuit, obviously depending on your case and your facts. But I think that, you know, when Alice first came out, um, there was a kind of a honeymoon period of where people thought that, oh, this is clearly a one-on-one -on -one case. It should be it should be overturned based on 101 out of the gate, no problem, um, or that it at least was a high probability of success. I think as the cases have evolved, it has become a much more mature analysis, much more nuanced, and all of that has to translate into the advice and counsel we give our clients as they are making their decisions about what risk to take and what money to spend on their defense or their attempts to prosecute their, you know, enforce their patents. I don't know if you see that any different, Rachel, but that's, that's kind of how I see it in the practice. Oh, I think that's very true. And I think we could probably spend an entire webinar breaking down this chart in various ways, um, breaking it out as you suggested by technology and going through actually where each of these judges stand. I think that some of the um, data, it's, this is also just a very high level um, look at where, where people are falling out, just a plus or a minus or yes or no, as opposed to really looking at what the claims, uh, like you said, by technology area and also, you know, how suspect the claims were. Some of these cases, I think, fall, I think the cases by and large fall on a spectrum where, you know, anybody might call some of them um, ineligible versus the others that are, that are much more borderline and much more difficult, I think, in our minds to parse out some of those that you feel like you could twist in both directions. And so I think it's also important when looking at this data to take it with a grain of salt that some of the cases are, are pretty cut and dry. So just that number doesn't give you an indication of where the, where the judge stands on 101 philosophically. And um, I agree with Linda, with I that, with um, I'd like to turn it over to you to see if we can have some Q&A from the audience. I think we have a few minutes left. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, just before we do ask the question, I want to take a moment to make sure to uh, let people know or ask people to fill out our brief evaluation survey so that we get some uh, input into the program and we can use it to um, guide our future planning programs, and we really hope that you'll do that. Um, so, you know, a lot of the questions are coming down on the area of uh, what are the best strategies for uh, prosecution going forward. Uh, one person asked, um, you know, who, what is the best um, time period, uh, what is the time period used to, to argue whether something is well understood or conventional? Is it now or is it the time of filing of the patent? And also things like, what is the best strategy for attacking question two that a, a, a two way that an invention is not an abstract idea or uh, rather do you need to prove up the something more? So, um, Manakshi, can you address some of the best yeah. strategies for prosecution? Sure, sure. Um, so basically, uh, as far as strategies in general going forward uh, with Berkheimer and the other cases we talked about today, um, provide specific details in your specification, how uh, your in invention is an improvement from a technical standpoint or what is in the prior art, and then put these details in the claims. Is, um, that's very clear from Berkheimer. Uh, for example, you know, I ask inventors I'm working with for data on improved efficiency, any tests they've conducted, um, uh, for example, on throughput, energy efficiency, usability, and then using this information in the specification when I draft. So definitely at the drafting stage, it's very important to have your specification right, um, even if, you know, and, and, and obviously your claims too, but the, the focus is on the specification to some extent now. Um, and as far as the question on the best strategies for attacking question 2A, meaning Alice step, uh, step one, uh, rather than trying to go to proving something more, um, I think it's best to look at some of the cases that have passed master under Alice step one. Um, and these all have some things, uh, some things in common, I think. For instance, you know, the, the cases I'm thinking about are Enfish, which was the self-referential database case, uh, Finjen, uh, which was about the downloadable security profiles that identified um, suspicious code, 
Um, core wireless is another one in the GUI context, um, efficient way of presenting data that lets somebody get to uh, a menu item quickly. So these all, all these claims focus on an improvement to the computer technology themselves and not on an economic improvement or some other task for which a computer is used in its ordinary capacity. So, um, and, and this doesn't have to do with the, you know, the hardware software divide it's that it used to be more of earlier pre alice but it's more of whatever you're doing. So if you can tie it to a, an improvement. So for example, the NFISH court um, emphasized that the patent uh, explained the multiple benefits of flow, that flow from the new design, um, the self-referential database as opposed to the relational database of the past, which was fast searching of data, smaller memory requirements. Um, the self-referential database could be configured on the fly as opposed to having a lot of extensive modeling and configuration of tables, which people were sick of. So this kind of um, information in your specification itself uh, can oftentimes help you avoid uh, going to uh, step two um, and, uh, you know, just look at the cases that have passed muster, I guess, under step one is what, what, what I would uh, suggest. Oh, so thanks, thanks for that. Um, the other questions that we see popping up here actually uh, are asking the panel to sort of have a crystal ball. So where do you think that the, um, the 101 eligibility is going to go based on the current administration's stated intention to protect inventors? Or uh, do, you see, do you see any changes going forward that would uh, influence and, and, protect, and perhaps give an advantage to either NPEs or inventors? Just where do you, where do you think we're going to go? Diane, maybe you have some insight on that one. Yeah, my thought on that is that we're going to see fewer rejections from the examiners based on 101. Berkheimer's, the Berkheimer menu, memo, to me, was a clear signal from the director to the core that he wants to see fewer 101 rejections. And if you're going to reject, you are going to have to really work to support that in order to comply with the, the standards for the core. And, you know, examiners are going to heed that, um, I think, and are going to um, issue fewer 101 rejections. How that will translate down the road at the courthouse is a different issue. So you may we may swing back to where we have more patents issue that are that perhaps shouldn't issue that are then subject to challenge in 101 on 101 basis in the courthouse that may fail because the examiners are going to be at least for some period of time applying tests and standards at the examination stage that may not actually square with what ultimately the en banc federal circuit will will hold or that will be uh, consistent with what district courts will employ. So, you know, it's it will be interesting to see, obviously, and it's going to take a lot of time for that to play out. Um, but I, I think that that's where that's going. Sounds good. Do you see any legislative changes happening? You know, there's several different proposals that have been circulating. There's a lot of changes. Obviously, there's changes happening at the Judiciary Committee on both the Senate and the House side um, that potentially would set up uh, introduction of additional legislation. I think the general feeling is that it's too late in this uh, legislative cycle for anything to happen this year. Whether or not after the midterms there's a shift, uh, there's a chance that that will, will happen. But until we get to the midterm elections, I don't, I don't think that there's much chance of any legislation moving, although there are, there are constantly people working to advance legislation on both the House and the Senate side. I think I tend to agree with you about that one. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, so thank you for attending today's webcast, 35 USC 101, Where Are We Now? Questions of Law and Fact. Uh, this presentation will be available on demand in the next week, so please uh, look for an email from us with the access link. And this concludes today's Finnegan webcast. Thank you all for attending.